Introducing our speaker this morning, Dr. Terry Morrison, Mortensen, rather. He has been with Answers in Genesis since 2001, but prior to that, he was a missionary for 26 years with Campus Crusade for Christ, including a, almost 20 years in Eastern Europe. He has been lecturing and teaching on biblical creation versus evolution since the 1970s, and he actually has a, his doctoral degree in the history of geology. He is an expert who believes strongly in the Word of God. He's published many articles. He's written many books. But perhaps his greatest um, evidence that he is a true creationist is that he and his wife Margie have eight kids and 20 grandkids. <laughs> so we are very thankful that Dr. Mortensen could be here with us this morning. Let's welcome him today. Well, good morning. It's really great to be with you this morning, and uh, one thing I like to always say is that all of those eight kids were wanted by my wife. <clears throat> and uh, I wanted them too, but she had to convince me. And she's a great wife and a great mother and a great grandmother, and I wouldn't be half the man I am without her, so I praise God for her. I do work for Answers in Genesis. We're a, a creation apologetics ministry gospel preaching ministry in uh, northern Kentucky in the Cincinnati area, and there in 2007 we opened our Creation Museum, which has had uh, millions of visitors from all over the world, 50 beautiful acres with a 70,000 square foot museum. We've got nature trails through our gardens with bridges over waterfalls. Uh, you can... Uh, pet some of the animals in our zoo, and uh, the little kids have a wonderful safe playground to play in and burn some energy, and we've got an 18-course zip line for the older kids to burn some energy, and then inside we have a 4D theater, um, a state-of-the-art planetarium. You can walk into 1% of Noah's, Noah's Ark and uh, built to scale. Our flood geology room answers questions about Noah's flood and the age of the earth, and uh, we've got animatronic dinosaurs and people. We have an amazing Allosaurus fossil, uh, one of the six best Allosauruses in the world. We have 95% of the skull and 50% of the skeleton. And uh, we also have uh, life-size, lifelike dinosaurs sculpted by our own Buddy Davis. We talk about the origin of man and we tell, show people that uh, Lucy was not our relative. She was an ape-like creature. We have a world-class uh, insect collection. Our bookstore is like a medieval castle. But we're not just there to talk about creation and evolution. We also connect Genesis to what's happening in our culture, and we present the gospel. We don't force anyone to listen to it, but it's there very clearly, and uh, we invite people to come to Christ because we're not just interested in people believing in a creator. We want them to come to know the creator through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Christmas is a great time to visit the museum. We have over 300,000 lights. They're already starting to put those up and uh, live nativity and, and other things. And then in 2016, we opened our Ark Encounter about 45 minutes from the museum. It's built to the dimensions given in the Bible, uh, almost completely out of wood. The three decks have 132 bays where we show people how they could have lived, and um, Noah is animatronic there and answers questions, and we show them how they could uh, care for the animals, how eight people could feed and water them all, uh, how many animals were on the ark, and we, we answer questions that people are really interested in, like, what did they do with all the manure? And how did they get fresh air and fresh water? And uh, how do we explain how all the species of land animals and birds today are descended from the ones that came off the ark? We talk about the ice age. We have things for kids of all ages to learn. And uh, we have a zoo there as well with some unusual animals. Kids can pet some of them or ride some of them. 
And uh, again, a wonderful, safe playground and a zipline course for the courageous. We also have a virtual reality experience where you can kind of experience the flood. And uh, it's a great time to visit at Christmas time as well. So stop spending your money at Disney World, who is polluting our culture. You will not only have a fun time at the Ark and the Museum, you will learn a lot, and your kids will learn a lot, and your faith will be strengthened. Well, this morning we want to talk about creation in six days, and, uh, or millions of years. And of course, we, we ask the question, you know, how did all the stars and the galaxies and the solar system come into existence? How did our Earth come into existence? And all the beautiful topography and, and landscape, and how did the different animals come into existence? Well, the story that is told all over the world in every country as scientific fact is the evolution story. The Big Bang, about 14 billion years ago, gas clouds collapsed eventually, forming the first stars, and then some of those exploded and produced more stars, and then stars got together and became galaxies. And Eventually, our, our sun was born, and it had a gas cloud around it that uh, eventually evolved into the planets, and uh, then our Earth was formed, and it was a hot molten ball, and it cooled, and over millions and millions of years, it developed layers of sedimentary rock with, with fossils in them, and, and those, those fossilized creatures are the result of a long evolutionary process where all the plants, all the animals, all the people are descended from a common ancestor, a little tiny bacterium. A lot of people say, well, I don't believe in evolution. What they mean is they don't believe in biological evolution. But evolution is actually a three-part theory to explain all of reality. So you have cosmological evolution to explain how stars and galaxies and planets came into existence geological evolution to explain how the earth was formed and how the rock layers and the topography, the, the mountains and the valleys formed. And then you have biological evolution to explain how all the plants and animals and people came into existence by a blind, purposeless, directionless process of time and chance and the laws of nature. But the Bible gives us a very different history. It tells us that God created everything in six days. He created different things on different days. He created in a particular order. And in Genesis 1, he tells us that when he made the plants and the animals and people, he created them after their kind, to reproduce after their kind. So one kind wouldn't change into a different kind. And so the evolutionary story is the evolution tree of life. All the different branches represent all the plants, animals, people, all descended from that little tiny bacterium. But the Bible speaks of what I call the creation forest of life. Each tree is a different kind of creature. So you have the dog kind, the cat kind, the elephant kind, the alligator kind, and the branches represent the variation within the kind. So you have big dogs and small dogs and dogs with long hair and dogs with short hair. And you have mankind where there's lots of variety. And no two people in this room look exactly alike because God loves variety within the kind. God created the world and he created Adam and Eve and they rebelled against God. They sinned and that brought the judgment of God on the whole creation. And then 1,600 years later, when the world had become so wicked, God destroyed the world with a global flood at the time of Noah. That's the biblical history. But I've had the privilege of speaking in 35 countries, and I've found that most Christians today don't believe that history. Most Christians accept the millions of years, and a growing number of Christians, including a growing number of evangelical theologians who say this is the inspired and inerrant word of God, believe in biological evolution, even the evolution of man. So <clears throat> there are Christians who believe in the whole evolutionary story. They're called theistic evolutionists or evolutionary creationists. And they just believe that God created the cosmic egg that went boom. And then God either pre-programmed the whole system up front to eventually evolve 
all the things that are in the universe, or he mysteriously, behind the scenes, in a way that scientists cannot detect, he has controlled or, or directed that evolution. But there are many Christians who reject biological evolution, and they just hold to old earth creation. And they say, well, God did really create the world like the Big Bang Theory says over billions of years, and the earth really is millions of years old, but God did supernaturally create plants, animals, and people. And there are lots of different old earth creation views. I'm not going to talk about all those tonight, but it's just amazing how many different views of Genesis there are. I can summarize all those differences with this diagram to show how people try to fit millions of years into the Bible. Nobody tries to fit the millions of years between Adam and us. It's always sometime before Adam. Some say, well, we'll those days aren't really literal. They're not 24-hour days. They're figurative days of long periods of time. So we can just spread those millions of years out over those days, and then that harmonizes the Bible with what the scientists say. Others say, well, no, those look like literal days, but we can actually put the millions of years between each of the literal days. So God did something special on a literal day, and then things developed from that, and then he did another special thing on the next day, and then things developed. Others say, no, the days are literal, and there's, there's no gap between the days, but the first day doesn't begin in verse three. They, uh, in verse 1, they say, Begins in verse 3, so there's actually a gap of time between Genesis 1-1 and verse 3, and that's where we'll put all the millions and billions of years. And others today say, well, no, there's no evidence of a gap there in the biblical text, but actually God created everything before Genesis 1 verse 1. He doesn't actually tell us when and how he created well, there's problems with all of those views, and I'm going to share some biblical reasons this morning. But anybody who's read the Bible very much at all realizes that there are different kinds of literature in the Bible. There's historical narrative, poetry, proverbs, uh, prophetic visions, parables, epistles, and they have different characteristics. And Bible scholars and even just a, a casual reader can recognize that there's a difference between those kinds of literature. In poetry, we expect figurative language like uh, the Lord is my rock and my fortress. That's not literal. That's figurative. And, and Jesus used figurative language sometimes. He said, I am the door. He wasn't made from wood. He's speaking figuratively. But when the Bible says he went up into Jerusalem and he died on a cross, that's history. And when he says that there was a great flood at the time of Noah, that's history. And when he says there was a, an exodus out of Egypt, that's history. And the waters parted, that's not figurative mythology, that's history. In fact, the Bible doesn't have any myths, except the ones it refutes, like the myth that the disciples stole the body of Jesus, which Matthew refuted in Matthew 28. But Genesis is history. And there's lots of lines of evidence that it is accurate history. There are the literary characteristics. And, and most Christians, even those who accept millions of years, most of them will say Genesis is history. But Jesus and the apostles had a lot to say about Genesis 1 to 11. And every time they refer to those chapters, they reveal that they took it as straightforward, literal history. And that's how the church took Genesis 1 to 11 uh, virtually unanimously for the first 18 centuries. So it's history. Well, if we're going to fit millions of years into the Bible, let's look at how they do it and why it doesn't work. Let's consider first the days themselves. <clears throat> God says he created in six days. But many Christians say, well, but those aren't literal days. Because yom, the Hebrew word for day, has different meanings. Well, that's true. The Hebrew word for day is yom in singular. In plural, it's yamim. And uh, in the Bible, that word yom has different meanings. It has a literal meaning referring to the light portion of a 24-hour day, just like our word day. It also has a literal meaning to refer to the whole 24-hour day. 
And it also has a figurative meaning in some cases. An indefinite period, longer than 24 hours, such as the day of the Lord, which is referring to a time of judgment in the future, not necessarily one single day. But there is no verse in the Bible that would lead you to think that yom means thousands or millions of years. But then when we come to the word yamim, the plural, days, every case in the Old Testament, that word means a literal day. Well, how do we know the correct meaning for yom in Genesis 1? Context. Context is king. Context determines the meaning of a word. If I just say the word day, you don't know what it means. I have to use it in context. And I'm going to use the English word day in a sentence. And I use it three different ways. Back in my grandfather's day, it took 12 days to drive across the country during the day. I just use day in three different ways. And you know the meaning in each case. And you can't move the meaning around. The context controls the meaning. Back in my grandfather's day, that's when he was driving between age 16 and 86. It took 12 days, 12 24-hour days to drive during the day. That's the light portion of the day. Well, Genesis makes it very clear that these are literal days. The word yom is defined literally the very first time it's used in the Bible. God created the world in darkness. He created the light in verse 3. And in verse 5, he says, God called the, day, the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning one day. So day is the light portion of a light-dark cycle, and it's the whole light-dark cycle. Then Yom is modified in this chapter by a number. So you have one day, second day, third day. Everywhere in the Old Testament where Yom is modified by a number, it always means a literal day. Then it's modified by the phrase, there was evening and there was morning. Everywhere in the Old Testament where the Hebrew words for evening and morning are used, whether they're used together in context or in the context, it always means, it's clear from the context, it always means a literal evening or a literal morning of a literal day. You know, I kind of get the idea that God's trying to tell us how long these days were. But then we come to verse 14, and yom is defined literally again in relationship to the heavenly bodies. God tells us why he created the sun, moon, and stars. It's so that we could measure seasons and years. And the movement of the heavenly bodies do enable us to measure those things. Now think about this. God says he created those sun, moon, and stars on day four, two days before man. But if the figurative of millions and billions of years if millions of years really happened then for most of their existence the sun moon and stars did not fulfill the purpose for which they were created namely for humans to tell time now what kind of a god would do this he creates the sun moon and stars over billions of years before he makes man and he created those things so man could tell time. What kind of a God would do that? A stupid God. Not the God of wisdom and power that's revealed in Scripture. And then we should note that God could have used other time words. If he really created over millions of years, there are plenty of ways he could have said that in Hebrew. He could have used the Hebrew word door, which is translated time or period or generation in other verses of the Bible. And if he didn't like that word, he could have used some phrases. He could have said that he created after many days or after many thousands of years or after many generations. And if he didn't like those words, those Hebrew words and Hebrew phrases, uh, he could have borrowed a word from Aramaic like he did in Daniel and Nehemiah where there are indefinite time words. God used the only Hebrew word that means a literal day. If he really created over millions of years, he used the worst word. He, he misled us. No, he, he didn't mislead us. He told us the truth. Then we should consider the order of creation versus the order of evolution. As I've already noted, the evolutionary view is you have the Big Bang billions of years ago. 
Stars formed, then the sun formed. Our sun's a young star. Uh, the earth formed out of the uh, gas cloud around the sun. It was a hot molten blob. It cooled, it, it developed a hard crust, it evolved an atmosphere, it rained, and uh, we had oceans. But the Bible says God made the earth completely covered with water for two days. And then he made dry ground and the plants. And then he made the sun, moon, and stars. So according to the Bible, peanuts have been in existence longer than planets. And grapes have been in existence longer than galaxies by one day. And you can't put millions of years in here without messing up Genesis because how could the plants survive for millions and millions of years before there's a sun? And then when we look at living things, there's more contradiction. The evolutionists say life began in the oceans before any land plants. The Bible says, no, land plants were created before any sea creatures, and the birds were created before the dinosaurs, the Bible says, but the evolutionists said, no, the birds evolved from dinosaurs. And what kind of a world would it be where God makes sea creatures and birds and then waits millions of years to create any land animals? And furthermore, how could he create plants millions of years before he creates the flying creatures that pollinate the plants? What kind of a God would make a world this way? Well, not the God of the Bible. He's too wise and powerful. That order is wrong. But then consider that man was created to rule over the animals. Genesis 1.28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing. So man was to rule over the creation. But if millions of years really happened, then most of the land flying and sea creatures lived and died and many species even became extinct before Adam and Eve could ever rule over them. All the dinosaurs lived and died and went extinct before Adam and Eve were made. All kinds of creatures lived and died and went extinct. What kind of a God would create man and command them to move, move, rule over all the, all the living creatures when most of them had already lived and died before he created man? Only a stupid God. Not the God of the Bible. But let's consider Exodus 20, 11. It tells us that these days were literal. And in my uh, many years of speaking on this subject and reading lots and lots of literature by Christians who are advocating the acceptance of millions of years, I have found that most of them, including brilliant evangelical Bible scholars, haven't paid attention to Exodus 20, 11. It's a critical verse. Where do we get the idea of a week? You know, you can determine the length of a day, a month, and a year by the movement of the heavenly bodies. But there's nothing up there that will tell you how long a week is. So where does that come from? It comes from the fact that God created in six days and rested on the seventh. And so it's no surprise that every culture in the world has a seven-day week. And God talks about this in Exodus 20 when he gives the Ten Commandments. Now, I've observed that nobody has any trouble understanding the other nine commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not use the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. Honor your parents. Don't lie. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. But they get to Exodus 20, and they either ignore it in verse 11, or they try to reinterpret it. But God says, in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and us all that is in them. And he uses the same word, days, that he used in verse 9 when he told the children of Israel, you work six days and rest on the seventh. And there was no Jew, no faithful Jew, who thought, you know, the conversation, Jacob, how, how long are you going to work? Well, I'm going to work six months and then take off a month. Oh, really? Well, I'm, I'm going to work six years and take a whole year off. No, they all took the commandment as literal because they understood that God created in six days. So this verse is a brick wall against millions of years. There are no millions of years in the days. There are no millions of years between the days. And then finally, for this uh, time this morning, Jesus was a young earth biblical creationist. And I have found among the writings of 
uh, of Christians who accept the millions of years that most of them have completely ignored what Jesus had to say about this. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus was asked a question about the Pharisees, and he said, Moses permitted us to divorce our wives. What do you say? And Jesus took them back to Genesis, and he says, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And then he quoted from Genesis 2, says that God created marriage. Now, we can diagram what Jesus believed about time from this verse. When Jesus made that statement, it was about 4,000 years after the beginning, according to biblical chronological information. And he says, Adam and Eve were right back there at the beginning of creation. And the sixth day on a 4,000-year time scale is the beginning of creation, speaking in non-technical, non-scientific, everyday language, which is what Jesus was speaking. But contrast that with what the evolutionists say. They say the Big Bang was about 14 billion years ago. And when do they say the first Homo sapiens came into existence? Well, anywhere from a couple hundred thousand to a million years, depending on which evolutionist you're talking to, because they can't all agree on exactly what a human being is. But even if you put a million years on a 14 billion year time scale, that puts man at the very end of creation history to date. So if Jesus believed that man was there at the beginning, if Jesus was a young earth creationist, if Jesus is my Lord, I can't have a different view than he had. Well, in the book that we have on the book table, uh, Coming to Grips with Genesis, a, a book that I co-edited and contributed to with 13 other scholars, I have a chapter on Jesus' view and uh, show all the verses in the Gospels that reveal that Jesus believed Genesis, and then I show uh, about 60 authors who haven't paid attention to what Jesus said, who say that we can accept millions of years. So Genesis, and indeed the whole Bible, teaches the days were literal, but there are many, many Christians, millions of Christians who don't believe that. And so I want to discuss just a few of the common objections. Oh, listen, Terry, uh, Genesis 1 tells us that and why God created, but not when and how he created. Whenever anybody says that, I think, you just are not reading the Bible. You're not reading Genesis 1. It certainly tells us that God created, but you go home and read it tonight. Genesis 1 does not tell us why God created, but it does tell us how and when. It tells us he created one day, second day, third day. It tells us 10 times, and God said, and it was so. God created by speaking. He spoke his creation into existence. It was supernatural. It was not natural. It was not the result of time and chance and the laws of nature over millions and millions of years. And Psalm 33 confirms this. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. God spoke things into creation. He didn't say, let there be light, and wait for millions of years for light to form. He didn't say, let the earth bring forth uh, vegetation, and wait for millions of years for little seeds to sprout and gradually grow and have eventually have fruit on their branches. No, he supernaturally created the first plants with fruit already on their branches so that the animals and the people could enjoy those fruits a few days later. When God speaks, creation obeys, except human creation. We rebel, but the rest of creation obeys the voice of the creator. Yes, but Terry, what about 2 Peter 3, 8? That shows they weren't literal days of creation. Yeah, let's look at 2 Peter 3, 8. A verse that's been used by old earth creationists for 200 years. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is, is, is like a thousand years. See, the, the days are like thousands of years. Well, if it says, if that's really defining the days in Genesis 1, then it's, it's, it's defining 
that those days were each 1,000 years, that doesn't help you harmonize with evolutionary thinking at all. But the verse isn't really saying that because we need to read the rest of the verse. And 1,000 years are like one day. So that just cancels out the first part of the verse. But actually, we need to read the verse in context. It's not defining the length of the days of Genesis 1. It's talking about the second coming of Christ. And scoffers who say, well, it's been a long time since since the Lord gave his promise of his return. Uh, He's never going to come again. And Peter says, well, don't, don't worry about that. God works on his timetable. This verse is about the the nature of God, not about the length of the days of Genesis 1. And it is ripping the verse out of context to take a New Testament verse using Greek to define the meaning of a Hebrew word in Genesis. You know, that Hebrew word, yom, is used over 2,300 times in the Old Testament. And it's interesting that this is the only place in Genesis 1 where Christians try to redefine day. You know, they they don't turn to the book of Joshua and say, well, it says that Joshua and the people of Israel walked around Jericho for seven days, and a day is as a thousand years. So, you know, how long did they really walk? (laughs) And, you know, Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, and a day is as a thousand years. So how long was he in that fish? Oh, but 2 Peter 3, 8 is in the New Testament. That's using Greek. And and in in the Gospels, it says that Jesus was in the grave for three days. How long is he? Was he in the grave? Now, this is is an example of well-meaning Christians doing exactly what the cults do. Ripping a verse out of context to make it say what it doesn't say. Oh, but Terry, you can't have solar days before the sun was created. Well, that's true. You can't have solar days because solar means pertaining to or dependent on the sun. But God didn't make the sun until the fourth day. So they weren't solar days the first three days, but they were literal days, just like the last three days. As Exodus already has told us that all of those days were literal days. Yeah, but how can you have literal days if you don't have the sun? Well, God is not dependent on the sun to create the phenomenon of light. He blinded Saul on the road to Damascus at noon on a sunny day, and it wasn't the sun. And in the New Jerusalem, there won't be any sun or moon, and there won't be any night. So God is perfectly capable of creating light without the sun, and he created the light on day one. Well, then people ask, well, what was that, what was that light? And my answer is, I have no idea, because God didn't tell us. But he clearly tells us he made the light on day one. Well, why didn't God tell us? Well, if God told us everything he knows, the Bible would be infinitely long. And at this point, I don't worry about that because Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God and the things revealed belong to us and to our children that we may observe them. So I don't worry about what God didn't say. I worry about what he did say. And he really did say he created the sun on day four, and he created the light on day one. Oh, yes, but Terry, yom is used in a non-literal sense right in the context. Well, that's true. In Genesis 2, 4, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord made heaven, earth and heaven. In the day that is a translation of be-yom. It's the Hebrew... Uh, Second letter, bait, attached to yom. It makes a prepositional phrase. In some English translations, it's just translated simply as when. But that's a very different construction and use of yom than Genesis 1, where we have yom with a number. Context makes the difference. You know, you have butter that you put on your bread. But you don't put a butterfly on your bread. Even though butter is in the name, It's a different use of butter. And it's a different use of yom. So in Genesis 1, you have those numbered days. Referring to literal days. In Genesis 2, 4, you have yom used in a non-literal prepositional phrase to refer to the whole creation week. Oh, but one of the professors, Old Testament professors at the seminary I attended 
Said too much happened on the sixth day to happen in 24 hours. Well, we need to look at what the Bible says happened. There were only two actors on that day. There was uh, God and, no, and Adam. So let's see what God did and how much time it took. Well, God created the land animals in the Garden of Eden. How long did it take God to do that? Well, I think probably about that long. Because God spoke those things into existence. God created Adam. Now, the Bible says he fashioned him from the dust of the ground. So he obviously was enjoying this. Uh, I don't think it took a long time, though. Let, let's say it took him a couple minutes or maybe an hour. God saw Adam's need. Well, now, how long did God take for that? Well, that's about like that. God put Adam to sleep. Well, I got all my uh, wisdom teeth removed in a, when I was a teenager, and my doctor told me to count to 10. I got to 7, and I was out. So I don't think it took God any time at all to put Adam to sleep. And then he created Eve, and of course, my dentist pulled four wisdom teeth out in 20 minutes, so I don't think it took God any time at all to create Eve from Adam's rib. Okay, thinking generously then, I would say that we've used maximum of an hour on that 24-hour sixth day. What did Adam do? Well, Adam started to tend the garden. Now, that's an inference. The text doesn't tell me that. But at this point, Adam is still living in obedience to God. So I assume God told him to start tending the garden, and I assume he did. But the Bible doesn't tell us how big the garden was. That Old Testament professor uh, he imagined that it was just this huge area, like, you know, Yellowstone National Park. But the Bible doesn't tell us that. Well, yeah, but he named animals. Yes, he named animals and birds. But we've got to pay careful attention to the text. He didn't name any sea creatures. That's where most species live. He didn't name any land plants. He didn't name any creeping things. He, didn't name the, he, he did not name the beasts of the earth... The Bible says he named the beast of the field. That's a subset of the beast of the earth. It was maybe, only, maybe it was only animals that would be domesticated. And he didn't name species. He didn't have to name, you know, Dawson, Great Dane, German Shepherd. He was naming the kinds. Dog, cat, elephant. With language that was built right into his head from creation. And I calculated that if he was sitting in the grass, and, and the Bible says God brought the animals to Adam. He was sitting in the grass, eating grapes. He could, be, he could, count, he could name a, a new animal. And not, not based on scientific observation of the anatomy and the behavior and the ecological habitat of each of these creatures, just like he named Eve. He hadn't studied her. He just named her woman. He could have named uh, one creature every 10 seconds, six a minute, 3,000 in 10 hours without breaking a sweat. And then Adam saw his need. Now, if you've been naming animals for 10 hours and you see they all come in pairs and none of them go with you, you would know that you're alone. And then if you fall asleep and you wake up and you lay eyes on the most beautiful woman you've ever seen, I mean, you would be poetic at that moment. So there was plenty of time in six, the 24 hours of six day to do everything that happened. Oh, but Genesis 1, 2, and 1 and 2 are contradictory creation accounts. No, they're not. Genesis 2 does not describe the creation of the earth, space, time, and light. It doesn't describe the creation of the expanse or firmament or land or sun, moon, and stars or sea creatures or creeping things. It's not two creation accounts. They're not contradictory. They're actually complementary because Genesis 1 through chapter 2, verse 3 is the wide-angle lens view of creation showing us Everything that happened in those six days and God resting on the seventh. And then Genesis 2 is the telephoto zoom lens view of some events on day six to give us some more details. The attempts to fit millions of years anywhere into Genesis 1 do not stand up to biblical scrutiny. 
And I could talk about a lot of other objections, but they are equally uh, weak. The Bible is clear. God created the whole universe in six literal 24-hour days. So you can't fit the millions of years into the days or between the days. So what about the gap? Well, as I said, and there are many versions of the gap theory, but they say, well, verse 1, that's in the distant past. We have no idea when that was. If the scientists say that was 14 billion years ago, fine. Then we have a gap of time in which you have the formation of stars and galaxies and the geological record of rock layers and fossils. And, uh, and some, some gap theorists people believe there was a Luciferian flood when God destroyed the world or Satan destroyed the world. And that produced the rock layers and the fossils. The Bible doesn't talk about such an event. And then you have Genesis 1 verse 2. The earth was formless and void. And you have six days of recreation. But the Hebrew doesn't allow for a gap in those verses. The grammar uh, doesn't allow you to put a, a, a gap of time in there. And the verb in verse 2 is was, not became. There are many gap theorists who say, well, the Bible should say in English, the earth became formless and void. But the reason that all of our English translations have was is because that's what the Hebrew verb is there. It can't correctly be translated became. And so our Bibles say it was. And so Genesis 1 verse 2 is a parenthetical statement. It's describing the earth just after it was created. So God created the earth in verse 1, and then before God went on to say anything about what else he created, he said, oh, by the way, let me just tell you what the earth was like at the beginning. It was completely covered with water and darkness, and then I created the light. The Hebrew words for formless and void do not imply judgment, as many gap theorists think. Those words are in Hebrew, tohu vabohu. And uh, by themselves, those words don't mean judgment. They just mean formless and void or empty. The only other place in the Bible where those words are used is Jeremiah 4.23. I looked on the earth, and behold, it was formless and void into the heavens, and they had no light. But if you read the context, which is about judgment... It doesn't say the land of Israel was formless. It still says there were mountains, there were the rubble of cities that had fallen, there were still animals in the world. It's the context of, Gen of, Roman, excuse me, of Jeremiah 4 that tells you that there's judgment associated with these words, but the words themselves don't mean judgment. And there's nothing in Genesis 1 to suggest there's any judgment going on in Genesis 1 verse 2. But then we need to come back again to Exodus, 4, uh, Exodus 20 because it rules out putting any time before the six days. For notice what it says. For in six days the Lord made what? The heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. He didn't make anything before the six days. He made everything in those six days. And if somebody objects and says, well, in isn't in the Hebrew, well, then take it out. It still means the same thing. For six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Well, now we go back to Genesis 1. When did God make the earth? Not in verse 3, when God said, let there be light. He made the earth in verse 1. So this verse, combined with Genesis 1, tells me that the first day begins in Genesis 1, verse 1. It does not begin in verse 3. So there is no gap between verse 1 and verse 3, other than, you know, maybe a minute or something. So Exodus 20 is a brick wall against millions of years. God didn't make anything before the six days. Day 1 begins in Genesis 1, 1, not Genesis 1, 3. So you can't put the millions of years into the days or between the days, and you can't put the millions of years before the days or before Genesis 1, verse 1. But there's a couple other points that we should bear in mind that confirm this understanding of Genesis. And one of those is 
the issue of death. In the evolutionary view, you have millions of years of death and disease and suffering and bloodshed, asteroids slamming into the earth, wiping out all the dinosaurs and uh, supposedly 60 or 80% of the other species, about 65 million years before man. It's nature red and tooth and claw. It's the survival of the fittest, which means that billions of unfit didn't survive. And it's that process, according to evolution, that led to man's existence. But the Bible says exactly the opposite. It says man was created in a perfect world, a very good world, where animals were not ripping other animals or people apart. There were no catastrophes. There were no natural evils. There were no asteroids slamming into the earth and wiping out creatures. It was a very good creation, God said. Man sinned, and that brought the judgment of God on the whole creation. So in evolution, you have death before man. In the Bible, you have man before death. You cannot believe both of those things at the same time. And there are a lot of different views on Genesis and there are lots of reasons, biblically and scientifically, to reject all of those. But they all have one thing in common. They all accept the millions of years. And most Christians who accept millions of years haven't thought carefully, if at all, about this problem of death before the fall. Those views are wrong because we can't accept the millions of years without destroying what the Bible says about the original creation, what it says about our fallen, cursed creation, and what it says about the future redemptive work of Christ when he comes again to create a new heavens and a new earth where there will be no more death, no more crying, no more pain, no more curse. Revelation 22.3 says. You see, when Jesus comes again, he's not coming again to fix a world that he did a lousy job of creating. He's coming again to put an end to the curse that he in his holy judgment brought on the creation because of the rebellion of his highest creation, man. There's another thing we need to think about this death issue and these fossils because they either were formed in all those rock layers and all those billions of fossils, they either formed before Adam or they formed after Adam. There's no other place to put them. If they were formed before Adam, the only reason anybody would think that is because of the teaching of evolution in millions of years. But if we believe that, then we're saying God looked at all those rock layers under the Garden of Eden filled with billions of dead things, and he says, well, that, that's all very good. But what kind of a God would say that? If we put it after Adam, the most logical cause of most of those rock layers and fossils is Noah's flood. So if we, reject, if we accept the millions of years, then whether we realize it or not, we have to reject or ignore Noah's flood. And I have found that most Christians in the world today who accept millions of years haven't even thought about Noah's flood. But it's critical to the question of the age of the earth. But if we believe what God's word says, then this is another reason why we must reject the millions of years. Well, the Bible tells us how long ago those creation days were. Adam was made on the sixth day of history. Genesis 5 and 11 give us the, the uh, chronologies, the genealogies from Adam to Noah and Shem, who was on the boat with Noah, to Abraham. And it tells us how old each patriarch was when the next man was born. And some people say, well, there might be missing names because there's missing names in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1. Well, I've read the arguments for those, and I don't think there are any missing names, but even if they're missing names, there are no missing years. Because it doesn't matter whether Seth was the son, grandson, great-grandson, great-great-grandson of Adam. He was born when Adam was 130 years old. And then there are several verses in the Old and New Testament that show us that Abraham was about 2,000 years before Jesus. So the age of the whole creation is only about 6,000 years. God's word clearly teaches six-day creation about 6,000 years ago. And therefore, the story of evolution in millions of years is a myth. Really, it's a lie, a diabolical lie to attack the word of God and the character of God. Those years and events never happened. 
Well, does it matter? Yes, it does. Genesis is foundational to the gospel. Jesus died for a real problem in real time space history. If, if Genesis is mythology, if that's make-believe, if that's a parable, then Jesus died for a make-believe problem, and he's a make-believe savior. And the more that people have rejected Genesis, the more the church has compromised the truth of Genesis, the more we have seen a resistance to the gospel and liberal churches and denominations and seminaries redefining the gospel. But Genesis is also foundational to morality. And the more you teach children and adults and congressmen and presidents and Supreme Court judges and heads of Hollywood and heads of corporate America that they're just animals descended from some other animal which descended from a little tiny bacterium that popped into existence by chance in the primordial oceans three and a half billion years ago on an earth that formed by chance around a sun that formed by chance as a result of a big bang that happened by chance and that is what is taught as scientific fact in every public school in America and in every other country of the world. The more you teach people that, the more they're going to reject Genesis, and the more they reject Genesis, the more they will reject biblical morality. Because the God of the Bible doesn't exist. That's mythology. And therefore, the, the moral laws of God that's just personal opinion of ancient, pre-scientific, primitive, superstitious Jews and Christians. You can just make your own rules. The Bible clearly teaches that men and women are made in the image of God. That Adam and Eve are the parents of the whole human race. That abortion is murder. That there are only two genders. That marriage is one man and one woman. The Bible clearly teaches that. But the Bible also clearly teaches that God created in six literal 24-hour days and that the flood was global and catastrophic and that the creation is only about 6,000 years old. It is biblically inconsistent to affirm the first five points but deny the last three because the Bible clearly teaches all these things. But similarly, there is no biblically consistent way to reject biological evolution, in other words, to affirm that God supernaturally created Adam and Eve and different kinds of plants and animals to reproduce after their kind. There's no consistent way you can reject biological evolution, but at the same time accept billions of years of geological and cosmological evolution. In other words, to deny what God says about the origin and age of the creation. You can't do it because the Bible clearly teaches about the origin of living things the same way it clearly teaches about the origin of the earth and the cosmos. It's all a matter of biblical authority. And the authority and truth of the word of God is under massive assault today in our culture and sadly in much of the church. And it's not just liberal theologians. I went to one of the best evangelical seminaries in the world, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. None of my Old Testament or theology professors were young earth creationists. And most evangelical seminaries in this country and around the world, the professors don't believe Genesis regarding the age of the earth. And so we need to be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks us to give an account, it's not good enough to tell our children or our grandchildren or our unbelieving neighbors, you need to believe the Bible. You need to believe in Jesus. They do need to believe because Jesus is who he claimed to be and the Bible is true. And there is a day of judgment coming. And there's no escaping that judgment unless we've put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to have answers. And so we've got a few answers out there in the, uh, in the foyer and uh, we've got a special conference pack here, five books for just $70. Uh, the answers book answers the 27 most asked questions. Where did Cain get his wife? Where did the so-called races come from? There's only one race, but where did they, all the differences in skin color and languages come from? What about carbon dating? Were the days of Genesis literal? Was the flood global? Can we believe in the gap theory? Where the, these are the questions people have today, and you don't need a science degree to understand the answer. 
Creation to Babel is a family commentary on Genesis 1 to 11 by Ken Ham. You can read this around the dinner table at night, just slowly working your way through those 11 chapters, learning the truth and learning how to defend the truth as a family. One Race, One Blood, a powerful book, the biblical answer to racism. If we'd believe what God's word says, we wouldn't have a racism problem. There's only one race. We have different shades of brown skin color, but we all have the same color. It's just some of us have more color than others. Will they stand? Ken's powerful message on the importance of raising strong believers, young people who will stand in a world that will increasingly challenge and ridicule and try to silence their faith. And I believe days of persecution will come to use force to get them to reject the word of God. We've got to build strong in the next generation. And then divided nation. Our country is divided politically, racially, socially, morally, religiously, and we're hemorrhaging the next generation. And Ken explains what pastors and parents can do about that to stand for the soul of our nation. So those, those books are all available as a pack. We also have a pack uh, for uh, five books, actually more than five, because one of those is eight books for uh, answers for the uh, grade school kids. Three of those deal with issues related to the age of the earth. But then we explain the gospel to those little kids and explain about racism to those little kids. And so all of those are available, and you can get that pack and the other pack all together as one big pack. Or if you want to just get one or two of those things and get something else, um, if you want to understand how the millions of years idea developed in the late 18th and early 19th century and how most of the church compromised with that idea and the catastrophic consequences of that, uh, my book, The Great Turning Point, will help you there. I've mentioned coming to grips with Genesis, giving an in-depth biblical defense of the literal history in Genesis, 13, 14 authors. And then I edited and contributed two chapters with uh, 15 other scholars defending the literal truth of Adam, biblically, theologically, paleontologically, genetically, anatomically, socially, morally, because Adam is under attack in the church today as well as in the, the culture. So any book or DVD, you can combine those together and make your own combination. I guess we don't have DVDs because nobody has DVD players anymore. Everybody uses their phone, I guess. But uh, great resources. And then um, our Answers magazine, it comes four times a year. Beautiful full-color magazine for the whole family, teaching the biblical worldview. Has a center section for the little kids. You get the digital subscription uh, free if you subscribe. And so you can watch it, uh, read it on your, on your electronic devices. And uh, you can sign up for that at the bookstore. You can also sign up for our free newsletter, which comes uh, 12 times a year. And we have over 10,000 articles on our website, adding more all the time, just about any question you could think of. Most of them understandable to lay people and students. We've got a lot of stuff for the really little kids. We have technical stuff. And uh, then we've got Answers.tv with over 5,000 videos of uh, kids' programs, documentaries, science lab experiments that can be used in school, nature programs, lectures, great, great learning. So uh, cancel your Netflix account and get some real teaching that will build your faith. And don't forget to pick up a brochure and uh, plan a trip to the Creation Museum in the Ark Encounter. Well, I hope that helps you understand not only that Genesis clearly teaches young earth, but that it really is important. And we need to stand today for the truth and the authority of the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for its long history of faithfulness to your word. And I pray, Lord, that you'd use these words this morning to strengthen your people. If there's anyone here who's been struggling with the millions of years, I pray, Lord, that you would help them to see that they need to believe your word. And if there's anyone here who has not repented of their sins and trusted in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. Lord, I pray that they would do business with you today. Thank you, Lord, that you are the sovereign Lord. You are working out your purposes in the world. 
You are, as we sang, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You are coming again, and you will judge the world in righteousness. And you will put an end to all of this wickedness and depravity and rebellion. And we thank you that Jesus went to the cross for us so that we don't have to face the wrath of God to come. We pray that you would bless your people and that you would use us as shining lights in this increasingly dark generation. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm.